Let's get into it today. I want to talk to you about worship Christ or the Antichrist. To whom is your worship loyal to? Now you can see behind me on the screen a picture of a church that has a rainbow flag, the ra rainbow flag representing the LGBTQ community. And this is something that is unfortunately becoming more common in the United States, where churches are expected to teach and preach about the love of God, but then our love is changing from a biblical standard into what the world defines what is love. Love does not accept all things. It believes all things. Which, what does that mean? Love has standards. God is love, and he's also a God of justice. Steve Hill, the evangelist at the Brownsville Revival, used to say all the time that a loving Savior will one day be a severe judge. And we have to recognize that God cannot compromise truth because he is the epitome of truth. He is the beginning of truth. It ends, it begins with him. There's nothing in between before or after him. And when he represents what true love is, he has standards. He cannot be a God of love unless he's a God of justice. Because if somebody does wrong and there's no justice, it's hard for us to understand how to communicate and define what love truly is. And unfortunately, the world is, is seemingly winning the battle in the church, especially at least in America, of redefining what love is. And I believe that this comes from the spirit of Antichrist. You know, many say they would never worship the Antichrist when he comes. Others say they would never deny the name of Jesus. But you know that Peter walked closely with the Lord for three, three and a half years and made a declaration that he would never deny the Lord and that yet he denied him three times and Jesus graciously restored him. And I understand that, you know, Peter was not born again because Jesus had not been raised from the dead and we have an advantage over what Peter had. Peter walked with Jesus physically, but Jesus lives on the inside of you and me now. And that's a little bit of a difference than what Peter had at the time when he had the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. But here's what I wanna, want us to understand, is that all of us are flesh and blood. And we are born again by the Spirit of God, which gives us a sense of understanding God's Word, revelation, wisdom, the knowledge of who Jesus is. But we are facing an enemy who for thousands of years has been the father of all lies. And if we think that within our own might, power, and strength that we're going to be able to resist him, then we are setting ourselves up for failure to accept the world standard of what love is based upon the spirit of Antichrist. It is absolutely important that we walk closely in relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because if we do not keep in step with the Holy Spirit, then we are in danger of what I believe could be part of the great falling away. I don't, I'm not worried about losing my salvation like I lose my keys. I believe that once we're saved, that it is possible to have security as a believer. I believe that you can know that you're saved and walk in confidence that he will never leave you or forsake you. However, from the prodigal son story, I do believe it is possible for us to walk away from the Lord and be enticed by temptation and still have a loving father who's waiting for us to come back to him. 
You know, I never preach revival as if it's for everyone. To me, revival is for the church. And the church that was once alive seemingly falls away, dies, and needs to be revived. And then those who are living in darkness when the church is living in revival will see the great light that you and I are supposed to represent the person of Jesus Christ. If we do not worship the Lord now, what makes us think that we will resist worshiping the Antichrist later? A well-known philosopher and atheist, Eric Hoffer, said this, the real Antichrist is he who turns the wine of an original idea into the water of mediocrity. This comes from an atheist. And I don't normally quote atheists in my life, but he seems to have a little bit of understanding of how easy it is for us to be deceived. And it's easy to walk with God when everything seems to be going really well in this life. But what happens when things get hard? And we say, oh, things are going great right now. Does anybody remember something called COVID? And how many people fell away? And how many churches are empty? And how hard it is to get people to stop watching church on TV and start coming back into the physical meeting of the body of believers? That's hard. Pastors in America and in the Philippines are having a hard time sometimes keeping the doors open because when they buy property and they build buildings and they invest so much before COVID took place and then their, their givers, their supporters, the people who serve, they leave, it's easy to see how quickly we can fall away. But my friend, I'm not here to, to focus on doom and gloom. I'm here to say that the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Christ is more powerful than the spirit of Antichrist. Yeah. And where we focus our worship will empower and prepare us to be able to resist the works of the enemy and not only resist but stand up with confidence and boldness to know that thus says the Lord as it comes out of our mouth we can say it with power we can say it with authority and we can see the spirit of the Lord move in our day and age the apostle Paul defines the antichrist as the lawless one or the man of lawlessness let's read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 it says concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him we ask you brothers and sisters not to be easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us there were others making false teaching in regards to the truth of what the apostles would in opposition to it whether by a prophecy or word of mouth or by a letter asserting that the day of the Lord has already come people were saying Jesus has already come back don't let anyone deceive you in any way don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed they're talking about the Antichrist, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in the temple proclaiming himself to be God. We don't see the third temple actually being built just yet, but things are coming together. And we need to pay attention not to only what's happening in Jerusalem and in Israel, but the spirit of Antichrist that is filling much of the earth and trying to intimidate the church from speaking the truth in love. Don't you remember, verse 5, that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back, the Antichrist, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. This is 2,000 years ago, my friend. 
And sin has increased. Death has increased. The world has grown more wicked even beyond that time. Verse 8, and then lawless, then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will, what? Overthrow. Say overthrow. overthrow. With the breath of his mouth. We're not talking that God needs to raise up an incredible army to fight the enemy. He just comes over and goes, God, there's no power or authority that the enemy had that has that the Lord doesn't allow him to have for a period of time. And he will destroy him. And, and, and the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power, signs, wonders that serve the lie. In all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Paul says that even... Though the Antichrist, what he's saying here, may not be here physically, that the spirit of Antichrist, the lawlessness, is already at work. The evidence of the Antichrist is causing a delusion in the world today. So much so that the first slide that I showed you is that people who, who were born a man or born a woman are being deluded into thinking there's something else that they were not created by God to be. And this is very sad. I'm not angry at the homosexuals. I'm not angry at the transvestites. My friend, for many years, I used to go right out here in Carino every night and share the gospel with the young men who were dressing like women and falling away, many of them being gang raped and experienced horrible abuse as I grew up. So I have a sense of compassion and brokenness. But when I see this delusion, when you and I see this delusion taking place right in front of our eyes, it should gravely concern us that if we don't stand for Christ now, that the spirit of Antichrist is just going to continue to bring destruction, to steal, kill, and destroy. The evidence of the Antichrist causes delusion world today. The Greek word for delusion is uh, plane. It means objectively fraudulence, subjectively a straying from orthodoxy or piety, deceit to deceive, delusion, error, a wandering, a straying about, one led astray from the right way, roaming hither and thither. This delusion is part of of God's judgment upon the world that we see in our lifetime. People say, is God judging? Well, not judging in the sense that he's bringing us all in front of the throne and saying, who's going to go to heaven? Who's going to go to hell? But it is this delusion that is a part of the judgment of God where the works of the flesh of men will determine where they spend eternity. Whenever we sin, we deny the Lord and the worship He deserves from us. Sin always agrees and partakes with lawlessness. So as Christians, we know that we should not sin because Jesus shed His blood on the cross for us. And it's very precious that He would do that for you and me. But when we sin and we get enticed, we're not thinking at the moment that we're participating in the spirit of Antichrist. That we're participating in lawlessness. Because nowadays, we don't hear preachers preaching against sin. We hear about people talking about fitting God into your life. Well, my friend, Jesus not only wants to be your Savior, but He wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your master. He wants to be the one that Paul said, I am a bond servant of the Lord. Now, Paul didn't say that out of context. Paul understood that it's by grace through faith that he's been saved. And he's not 
saying, I want to be a slave of God because he wants to prove something to God. No, he understands that the salvation he received through the blood of Jesus is not something of his own effort. It was by grace, the love of God. But yet that love is what's constraining him and causing him to preach the gospel. Because when we stand in faith and speak the truth in love in our generation, I believe that we're acting like Daniel. We're acting like Daniel in the midst of Babylon, where God raises up a young man who is not intimidated by what's happening around him because he is intimate with his God. He's not afraid of what can happen to his body. He is more concerned about his right relationship with his father that has given him everything. And my friend, I believe that we are going to see some of the greatest revival, some of the greatest awakening, and it's going to be through simple people. God will use the foolish things of the world to put the wise to shame. God will use ones that, that nobody expects will be used. You see, this is how I pray. Father, I pray that you would bring down that kingdom of Kibaloi. I do. You know why? Because there's millions of people that are deceived, my friend. And they're in delusion of believing that the Messiah comes from Kalinan. And while it's funny because we know how ridiculous it sounds, the fact of the matter is, I can't joke about it because I'm concerned where these people are going to die and if they're going to be in hell or heaven for eternity. But my prayer is, God, that we would speak the truth, that we would speak against the delusion, that we would stand up and be counted for as a church and not be ashamed of the gospel. And we would stand up and say, there is only one name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus, the Christ. There's no antichrist. There's only one Christ. 1 John 3, 4 says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. See, this should make us say, I got to put away the pornography. I got to put away the secret sin. I got to put away the lying, the gossip, as our brother was talking about earlier. We, we have to walk in a holy fear of the Lord. You see, I don't want revival that makes me just feel good. And and I agree earlier, I believe it was Pastor Al was talking about, hey, when the glory, the kabod of God comes down and people fall down. Look, my only idea of why people fall down is that the God of the universe, when he comes upon your body, you might fall down. (laughs) But I don't care if you fall down. What matters is do you get up different? Do you get up and do you say, I got to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon his name while he is near. I long for the glory of God to be revealed in and through my life. I want to see the Philippines. I want to see my Jerusalem, Davao City. I want to see Mindanao. I want to see Philippines and the nations falling on its knees before the Christ that gave his blood for us. Listen, delusion always leads to idolatry. Idolatry is evidence that the spirit of Antichrist is among us. Let's look in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel. That means if we're not preaching the gospel, the righteousness of God will not be revealed. Jesus did his part, but he commissioned you and I to preach the gospel. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, written, the righteous shall live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed now. It's part of this delusion from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by wickedness. We have seen a great increase of wickedness in the earth, even through this whole season of COVID and coming out from it. I'm not even sure where the nation that I was born in, um, where it is as far as being a Christian nation anymore. 
It's, an, it's become an atheistic, agnostic place. And people who said they believe in Jesus won't even say that they believe he's God to this day. Oh, there's still some very strong churches and praying churches and a great missions movement that comes from America. But things are changing. And if America changes and loses its whatever type of status we've had in the world, the whole world is going to feel that. And we have to depend on the Lord. We have to preach the gospel. I don't believe Donald Trump is the Messiah. I don't believe that other politicians are going to be able to fix our problem. Our problem is a sin issue that only the blood of Jesus can fix. And unless we are convinced that there's no man, there's no woman, there's no amount of money, there's nobody who could save us except Jesus Christ alone. He is the only one who knows how to deal with the Antichrist. Then we will know how to preach the gospel and take back ground that we should never have lost in the first place. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Everybody knows what sin is. It's written on their hearts. That's what Jeremiah tells us. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Nobody will be able to stand before God one day and say, I didn't know. It's impossible. He will be proved righteous in everything that he says and does. That's why it should be in our hearts as his church, as his sons and daughters, to preach this gospel, to proclaim the name of Jesus. Because as we do that, my friend, we are valuing the blood of Jesus in a way that this world doesn't always see because there's been so much hypocrisy in the church. Verse 21 through 23 for although they knew God they neither glorified him as God or nor gave him gave thanks to him but in their thinking became futile and their fu- foolish hearts were darkened although they claimed to be wise they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles What are we saying? We're saying that this delusion that's taking place is trying to cause people to worship themselves, to worship the things of this world, to worship some form of idolatry. And by doing so, it gives strength to the rise of the Antichrist. And I don't want to participate with that. I don't want my sin to prepare the way for the coming of Antichrist. Amen. Amen. I want to be a man of purity, integrity, and holiness. I want to speak the truth. I want my marriage. I want my kids. I want these fire school students. I want all of you to be challenged to walk closely in intimacy with the Lord in such a way that we're so convinced about why we believe what we believe that we're preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. Amen. You know, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman, he exposed her idolatry of Jacob's well. I never thought of that until I read this in this context. He went there to confront idolatry. Everywhere Jesus went, he was confronting idolatry because we have a sin issue. And sin leads us into delusion. Sin leads us away from God. It takes our worship that belongs to the one and only God that should be placed on him with all of our affection, heart, soul, and mind. And it puts it on something that steals it from God. Now if we look, he came in verse 4, John chapter 4. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. I like how that says he had to go through Samaria. Jesus didn't ignore what was happening around him. Jesus could have just stayed with the Jewish people. Jesus could have just stayed because he came to, to, to the Jew first, right? 
And he could have stayed there and he knew he was going to be persecuted. He knew he was going to be crucified. But yet he had to stop alongside one day and go to Samaria because there was somebody there. Not only her, but there was a group of people that he loved and he created that was struggling with idolatry, with a delusion of sin. And so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, which actually I believe it means drunkenness. Sychar. And near the plot of ground of Jacob had given to his son Joseph. You know, there's so much, if you've ever been to Israel, you know, or other places in the world that are considered areas of where supernatural events took place, where people worship the location instead of the Savior. I didn't have to go to Israel to find Jesus. I had Jesus before I went to Israel. And when I went to Israel and I understood the stories and we went from place to place to place, all I did was weep the whole time because I felt the presence of the Lord was with me, reminding me of his word. And it was spectacular. If you've never been to Israel and you'd like to go, pray. Ask the Lord to open the doors for you. But when you go there, please make sure that you bring Jesus with you and don't go there to find Jesus. <laughs> Jacob's well was there and Jesus was tired as he was from a journey sat down by the well it was about noon even when Jesus is tired he was ready to work, meet with this lady when a Samaritan woman came to draw water he said to her will you give me a drink his disciples had gone into town to buy food a Samaritan woman said you're a Jew and uh, I'm a Samaritan woman how can you ask me for a drink, you know, because Jews and Samaritans, we don't associate with each other. But see, Jesus, she had an agenda to go to that well. And yes, she was going to get water, but there was something very unique and special that made her feel probably spiritual every time that she went to that well. But Jesus was tired of her worship being given to a well and to something that happened some maybe thousand, two thousand years beforehand. And he wanted her to know that he was the one that Jacob was talking about. <laughs> Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. In other words, what you're giving your life to on a daily basis by coming to this well and maybe going through some type of systematic way to get the water because she's thinking about that this is holy ground, right? Because of what took place there. She didn't realize how holy that ground was when the Son of God was standing right in front of her. But she didn't have revelation. The only thing she knew was that her worship was be given to a false god that she didn't understand. She had a form of godliness in her mind, but she had denied the power of God. She was blinded from the truth. And people are deluded. I don't, they don't, listen, homosexuals are not the only one deluded. Religious people are some of the most deluded people that I've ever met. People who call themselves Christians have a form of godliness, but don't walk in the power of God. I was one of those folks. I was addicted to pornography for seven years. And I was a youth pastor in a church. And I knew how to have a fish on my car, wear Christian t-shirts, and go about doing all kinds of things. My youth group was successful. We had 70, 75 teenagers every week. We looked awesome to everybody. But nobody knew that I had idolatry in my life. My, my issue wasn't just pornography. My issue was a worship of self. I was afraid of what other people thought. And I didn't want to give up my pride and my secret sin lifestyle because it would cost me too much. But yet Jesus died naked and was beaten and whipped and bruised for my sin. And I just didn't get it. But then one day I got it. And I started to realize that I needed to humble myself. And when I did, everything changed in my life. Everything. Listen, we got to get tired of drinking the water of this world and start drinking that heavenly river. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. 
It's so much bigger than you, sir. Don't you realize how important this well is? Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than Jacob, our father, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? As did his sons and even his livestock? Jesus simply answered her. And this is, he's, he's answering a lady who is very devoted. He's, he's, she's, she's committed to what she's grown up believing. And there's a lot of people here in the Philippines very committed. You know, if you ask anybody in the Philippines if they're a Christian, 80% of the time you're at least going to hear somebody say yes. Because 80% of this country is Catholic. But we must be born again. Amen. We must be born from above. It's not about attending church. I don't care what church you're a part of, what denomination, who your favorite teacher is, how many scriptures you can quote. I want to know one thing. Do you know about Jesus or do you know Jesus? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your lips? Do you go throughout the day with Jesus on your heart? Do you live, breathe, eat, sleep, and drink Jesus? Are you consumed by the lover of your soul? See, she didn't understand that. She was able to go to the well sometimes every single day, do what she needed to, and leave her God the well at the well and go live her life the rest of the time that she wanted to. She had only a loyalty that was based upon religious duty. It wasn't based on revelation and truth of God's word. Jesus answered, anybody who drinks this water is going to be thirsty again. If you keep worshiping the way that you do, if you keep compromising the word of God and worshiping idols and living in sin, you are giving in to the spirit of antichrist. And I'm telling you that I have a water that the water I give them, you will never thirst again. It will become a spring of water with you. In fact, you won't have to come to the well anymore. The well will be in you. Amen. The river, the flowing presence of God will abide with you and will never leave you or forsake you. You don't have to go here to get this walk back and work so hard day after day after day trying to please and worship man and, and some false God. The God who wants to come and who is speaking to you right now will come and live in you. Verse 15, the woman said, Sir, give me this water. I don't want to get thirsty anymore. I don't want to keep having to come draw water. She was tired. She was wore out, not by the religious duty of going to get water all the time, but because of her own sin. Delusion is wearing people out, my friend. There are people all throughout the Philippines that are tired and they are hopeless. You know why people get drunk? You know why people do drugs? You know why people have adulterous affairs and are, and are doing things they should never do in secret and they call themselves a Christian? Because they are depressed. They're hopeless. There is this delusion that's hanging over them. It's like a dark black cloud of sin that's over them all the time. It's called the spirit of Antichrist. And they don't know how to get free from it because the enemy doesn't want them to get free. And he's going to do whatever he can to keep them. But see, when you and I get out there and we proclaim the truth in love and we do exactly what Jesus is saying and we don't point the finger at us and say, if you just come to my church, you can get saved or you come to my Bible study. Friend, I want us to learn how to bring Jesus to the people. I want them to learn how to come and be convicted by their own sin and cry out to God and say, what must I do to be saved? Sir, give me this water so I don't get thirsty anymore. He told her, go call your husband. Come back. And she lied. She said, I don't have a husband. Jesus said to her, you were right. You don't have a husband. Because right now, God is speaking to you and knows everything about you. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. See, that's the word of the Lord. 
See, this is what God is putting in your mouth and my mouth. This is the sword that comes out of our mouth when we are under the spirit of Christ and not under the spirit of Antichrist. When we preach the truth in love, Sister Emia, right? I don't know how many years was it ago that we prayed for you? Over 10 years, right? I, we never met. And we went to her house and church on the way to Kalinan, just before Kalinan, we were invited to speak there. I took some students who were disciples. This is so many years ago. And we went there and I'm preaching and her husband, who's apparently just gone to be with the Lord this past year, Brother Eddie, a wonderful man of God. I was preaching and she was not in the church. And, and as I'm preaching, I, I felt like I couldn't preach anymore. Like I had to stop and ask the pastor during the message, where is your wife? I, I was compelled, and this is my first time at a church. You don't, you don't want to just go in there and, you know, just assume anything. And he said, my wife is, is very sick. She just had a heart attack, right? And she's in the bed at the house and can't really get out of bed and has to rest. And has been like that for some period of time at that point. And I said, that's why the Lord brought us here. And so we went and we prayed and we go into that room and we prayed for her, not just myself, but some other students and her husband who were with us. We prayed and we left. It was probably some years, at least a couple years, I think, after where I'm sitting in LTO and and, you know, I don't like to sit in LTO like any of you. You know, it takes quite a while sometimes. And while I'm sitting there. She walks by and recognized me and says, are you Pastor Eric? And I said, yeah. She said, Corazon, right? Uh, Amia. She said, she said, do you remember me? I said, I I'm sorry, I, I, I don't. She said, you and the team prayed for me some time ago and the Lord healed me after that. Hallelujah. Friend, I'm just gonna tell you, that wasn't because of Eric Miller. I don't, I don't carry that kind of power. Only Jesus does. Amen. But I'll tell you what happened. I, I didn't know she was going to be here today. And she came up to me and, and said something. So to me, I'm just going to tell you that there is a power. There is an authority that's on us. And look, I've prayed for lots of people and didn't see them get healed. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've, I've, I've sowed seeds, watered seeds of the gospel to see people get saved. And they didn't give themselves to the Lord. But then the ones that do, and the ones that keep walking with the Lord, and, and keep walking in a sustained relationship with the Lord, you look at that, and that becomes a sign and a wonder that gives glory to God. Let me finish this up. She said, I could see that you're a prophet. <laughs> you think so? Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. And he said, look, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. In other words, stop worrying about a place. Stop worrying about putting your worship in the right place all the time. I'm trying to tell you where to put it right now. It's not about the location. It's not about that well. It's not about Jerusalem. It's about me. Amen. Verse 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, salvation comes to the Jew first because God wants to fulfill his covenant a relationship to the Jewish people. And if he doesn't fulfill his covenant promises to the Jewish people, then you and I who are Gentiles can't believe that he upholds his promises. Yet the time is coming and, and has now come when true worshipers, say true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. No more idols. No more delusion. No more hypocrisy. No more sin. We worship the Lord vertically. He's the only one. 
These are the type of worshipers the Father's seeking. God is a spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. I think Jesus looked at her. And the Bible doesn't say this, but I wonder if he had a tear in his eye. Because I bet you that he looked at her. And he had been waiting to say this to her since she was born. I am he. The one you just talked about, the Christ, it's me. Jesus didn't do that with everybody. See, this conversation that Jesus is having with this woman is untying the knots of sin and delusion in her life. And he's bringing freedom. He didn't bring out a bigger gun to tell her that what she believed was wrong. He was taking away her bullets. And she had nothing else to stand on. And then he reveals himself. Why? Because she saw that she needed a savior. Amen. And when at that point, I believe the light went on. I'm getting ready one day when I go to heaven, you go to heaven, I want to meet this woman. <laughs> What was it like when the light clicked on, right? It was like the two guys walking with Jesus after he rose from the dead on the road to Emmaus and he disappeared from their sight. And what did they say? We're not our hearts burning within us. Oh, friend, I don't know about you, but I have a burning heart. My heart really burns for the Lord. And it's not just an emotional burning. It's a worship burning. It's something that that causes me to want to be with him. It causes me to want to honor him when nobody else is looking. I want to ask everybody to stand. Jesus, we want you to have your way. I come against that spirit of Antichrist today. So I ask the spirit of Christ will come in here today and release forgiveness where it is necessary. Release healing where it is needed. Release miracles. Release provision. Release blessing. Because you are our high priest. Amen.